is subdued. Another day has westered and mantling darkness arrived. And as he describes preparing himself for his night's sleep, he thinks and reflects and says, let your last thinks be thanks. It's a line I've always loved. These aren't quite my last thinks for the evening, as we all know, <laughs> you perhaps do regret, but I have to start with thanks. Thanks first and foremost to the members of the American Historical Association who did me the extraordinary honor of electing me to this office. Thanks to the staff of the American Historical Association, sine qua vis non, who do an extraordinary job as if it were ordinary every day, year in, year out. Thanks to the extraordinary program committee who have made this a marvelously exciting, rich, and fabulously rewarding set, uh, meeting of the, of the American Historical Association. And thanks finally, and above all, to Jim Grossman and Bill Cronin, Bill for that wonderful introduction, but both of them for a year of extraordinary collegiality and comradeship, which has involved some difficult moments, some caused by Bill. <laughs> but which has been one of the most rewarding years of my life. It has been extraordinarily gratifying to serve the association to the extent that I've been able to, and I've been able to thanks to the help of all these extraordinary people. <coughs> Francis Daniel Pastorius liked to make jokes. Unlike most of us, he liked to make them in Latin. And instead of making them aloud, he liked to confide them to his books. Among his favorite writers was a Leiden University historian, Georg Horn, 1620 to 1670, who endeared himself to his students by running naked through the streets from time to time. When people looked at him askance, he said, can't you recognize a paradisal man? I'm Adam, and went on. And who attracted attention in the Republic of Letters in the 1650s and 1660s for his polemical works on the origin of the American peoples and his surveys of European history and politics. In 1666, he brought out a typically short textbook on a typically big topic, the history of nature from the creation to the present and God's relation to it in 200 small pages. He gave it the catchy title, Arca Moses, Moses' Ark, or the History of the World. And in the engraved title page, which you see, Pharaoh's daughter is discovering the infant Moses. Turning towards a companion, she holds the baby up in what the British still call a Moses basket. Writing in a sinuous that follows the highlighted section of the Egyptian princess's legs and then moves onto the surface of the Nile, Pastorius enters a line of Latin with alternate endings. Est mihi manqua domi pater, est crocodilus in illo, or et ipse, which means either, depending on which ending you choose, I have a father at home, and there's a crocodile there too. <laughs> or, I have a father at home, and he's a crocodile. <laughs> The remark seems mysterious, but its obscurity was partly deliberate. It was an illusion, a challenge, designed to provoke the reader. In the third of the Roman poet Virgil's great eclogues, his pastoral poems, the shepherd Monachus refuses to bet one of his sheep against the rival piper as he explains, I have a father at home, and there's a mean stepmother, and they both count the flock twice a day, and one of them counts the kids, too. Evidently, something about the illustration reminded the German in rural Pennsylvania about the ancient epic poet. Perhaps as a good Christian humanist, Pastorius meant to suggest that Virgil's imaginary shepherd and Pharaoh's daughter both struggled with difficult families. Each had a harsh father. The one counted sheep, the other mistreated Jews. And while Menalcus had to deal with a wicked stepmother, Pharaoh's daughter confronted a sharp-toothed reptile. I haven't found a more convincing answer. Perhaps you had to be there. But Pistorius's bad joke is more than a tiny learned puzzle. 
As the cultural historians who were the masters of my generation, Robert Darton and Carlo Ginsberg, taught us long ago, historians should utter whoops of glee every time we encounter a historical actor making a joke or espousing an idea or carrying out an action that absolutely baffles us. For if we can manage to identify the now forgotten codes by which those expressions or those actions make some kind of social and cultural sense, we not only cease to be befuddled, we experience for one exalted instant the past at its full, demanding, frightening distance from us. And that's what I will try to do tonight. Now, in the case of Pastorius, the puzzles are really acute. Pastorius was an eminently practical man. He founded Germantown. He created its legal codes. He compiled its register of properties, and he served the settlement in several legal and political capacities before ending his life as a schoolmaster in Germantown and then in Philadelphia. He compiled enormous collections of Germantown law and, uh, and uh, procedural matters for Philadelphia lawyers. He doesn't look like someone who would want to spend his time covetously entering little Latin tags into Latin books. For one thing, he insisted, as we'll see, on the central importance of English and the education of his sons, who ended up practicing trades. He spoke with contempt in his most famous book, A Description of Pennsylvania, of the universities of Europe. Many professors waste their time on useless questions and clever trifling tricks there, he says. And while they detail the minds, of, while they derail the minds of the learners on empty questions, they prevent them from aspiring to more solid matters. And to historians of the current generation, Pastorius poses even greater puzzles. He seems a natural, a characteristic figure of the global republic of letters, as that has been laid open for us in luminous and learned books by Hal Cook, Florence Shaw, Neil Saphir, and other scholars, who have shown us how the networks of learning in the decades around 1700 extended outward from Europe to mission parishes, trading stations, colonial fortresses, all of which served as trading zones, not just in the literal sense, but also in Peter Gallison's intellectual sense. Zones where languages were forged, creoles, which enabled different cultures to understand one another. Zones where trading took place, where objects, plants, medicines, symbols, stones, and knowledge languages, information about history and culture were brought together, assembled into their shocking holes, and sent back to the metropole. This is exactly the sort of intellectual Pastorius ought to be. A Latin writing German in Philadelphia, he retained his contacts with Germany, corresponded in Latin, as we'll see, with friends there, sent back not just information about Pennsylvania, but a magnificent description of the, of the territory, making clear that any sensible European could do nothing better than move immediately to the paradise of Pennsylvania. He was, in other words, hooked into those networks. He was hooked in at the same time to the live world around him. He worked with the Lenape Indians who lived near him, traded with them, tried to protect them from the ravages of less gentle traders, like his friend, that magnificent combination of Isaac Newton and Mr. Burns, James Logan, greatest book collector of the colonies and most vicious fur trader, one and the same time. Yet Pastorius resolutely refuses to be that person for us. He will not do it. He wants to read those Latin books and do things with them. That's the puzzle that he poses. He somehow maintains the traditions of a Latinate scholarship deeply rooted in the humanistic school, even as he denounces them or some form of them as preposterous and immoral. immoral. He's deeply engaged in the kinds of practical matters that made many colonials see themselves as far more authoritative about the real worlds than the European scholars who had trained them, yet he never took that position. 
What I hope to show is that Pastorius's way of entering strange little jokes in his books sheds light not only on the obsessions of a single strange German, though I will not deny he was a strange German, but also on the larger history, which we've been discussing in this conference, of the practices of managing information, one of the central histories of European civilization, and on the ways that that history and the history of ideas intersect and interfere with one another. Born in 1651 in the Franconian town of Sommerhausen, Pastorius came from a well-off family and studied law at Altdorf, Strasbourg, and Jena. He was inspired by the pietist Philip Jakob Spener to um, feel discontent with the Lutheran orthodoxy of his world and came to America in June 1683 in search of a simpler life and 15,000 acres of land for Quakers whom he had met in Germany. He stayed till his death in 1719, worked hard at many callings, fought for his community of Germantown, gardened and fished, and read. Read constantly, read all the time. In a Philadelphia that had no bookshop and no printer through his lifetime, and in which the stock of books only gradually expanded, Pastorius somehow managed to master everything from Renaissance works on world history and natural philosophy, to Quaker tracts on silence, to discussions of the diseases prevalent in the New World, to alchemy, which, like his older contemporary governor, Winthrop of Connecticut, he found absolutely riveting. Winthrop, another great reader and collector. Pastorius didn't only read, he read in an active, energetic, engaged way, as we've already seen him do, projecting himself into the books. His comment take, his comments take many forms. Oh, sorry, that's Mr. Pastorius, and that's his, his final handsome house in Germantown. His comments take many forms. On the left you see him, on your left you see him reading a description of the Imperial Chamber Court at Speyer. Spira in Latin. Here Pastorius wrote, writes, many lawsuits spirant, but they don't expirant here. Many lawsuits breathe here, but they don't ever come to an end. Sometimes he gives a text a lie direct. On the right he finds a passage in which Horn describes Quakers, Shakers, and Fifth Monarchy men as sectaries of the same kind and says, this is all false. Here he puts himself in that great tradition of readers that goes back to Petrarch, who, when he found something he disapproved of in the letter of Cicero's, wrote a letter to the Roman in order to explain his complaints. Sometimes he would fill the margins of an opening with commentary or supplementary information, as here, where he offers a marvelous way of steganography, hidden writing using the leaves of American plants for the letters. And occasionally, like John Adams, the better known graphomane, you see Adams's copy of Mary Wollstonecraft on the left, the margins in which he carries on his magnificent dialogue with her. Sometimes, as here, when he read a book by a Jesuit, his heart's abhorrence and became really annoyed, he would fill the whole margin with arguments with the original. He read, he responded, he marked the text up, and then he took the next step, and it's the next step which is the really extraordinary one. He sliced, he diced, and then he made sausage. <laughs> this is the beehive, one of the several magnificent commonplace books on which Pastorius spent his life compiling. The very appearance of the books is shattering. This is 800 pages long. It's a monument to graphomania. It reminds me every time I read it, and happily you can now read it in the comfort of your hotel room because the University of Pennsylvania Library has digitized this treasure. I, every time I read it, I feel as if I'm walking in one of those German forests in which the trees have been planted in very orderly rows, and you walk between them in a very straight path. It reflects the patterns of attention that are utterly unfamiliar in the age of the Kindle. And once you begin to look at the text of any of these notebooks, the patterns of attention become stranger.